What a thrill we've got for you today. Lorenzo Romar, you've heard him as a Washington head coach. He's now with Pepperdine, a second go-around with the Waves, has won over 400 games, is a standout recruiter, won a national title with UCLA as an assistant under Jim Herrick in that famed 1995 year. Multiple years, Romar was a player in the league. Golden State, Milwaukee, and Detroit. I'm Brian Fenley and Lorenzo. As I start to read a little bit of your resume, so much more that you've accomplished that I did not include in that intro, how does that feel for a guy like yourself coming from Compton and making all of this happen? Blessed, understanding that I've uh, uh, been very, very blessed to be able to uh, have the experiences that I've had uh, I was obsessed with the game of basketball as a young kid and still obsessed with it, but uh, almost sickly when I was coming up. And to be able to bend through the different situations athletically has just been great. And it's taught me a lot about uh, life. To what extremes would we see that obsession? Was this something where you would play in the gym for 14 hours in a day. Give us a sense, a tangible sense of what that obsession looks like feasibly. Well, when I was younger, uh, I'd get to school an hour before and play before school, then play during lunchtime and then play after school during the winter when the street lights would come on about 5.30. I'd play until then and then uh, go home and would uh, look through my basketball cards, <laughs> look at any game that was on television or even listen to it on the radio to a point where I would even keep score uh, of, of the games myself. Just would read all of the publications and knew all the basketball players around. So when I was younger, that's kind of how it went during the weekday, during the weekend, just spent all my time after the morning cartoons uh, <laughs> down at the playground, down at the corner where we lived in Compton and, was, was there all day and evening on Saturday and Sunday. And then in, in the summertime, you know, I played baseball and football and other things, but was pretty much from 10 o'clock in the morning till now the street lights come on at 8 o'clock. Wow. 10 to 8 every day, out playing. And it wouldn't be consecutive 10 till 8, but it would be around there, go get something to eat, uh, to the market, come back, uh, that type of thing. But it was ongoing when I – when I got to uh, college, uh, I would play in several leagues. You know, uh, it was not uncommon for me to leave basketball practice to go play at a gym. Wow. I remember one time uh, <clears throat> in particular, uh, when I was in junior college, we had practice. Uh, and it was a holiday that okay. day. And I had to always catch the bus to practice. And this particular day, practice, I think, was around 2 o'clock. I uh, wanted to get there early, so I arrived at the bus stop about 11 o'clock. And about an hour went by, and the bus didn't, it didn't come through. And a, a gentleman said, you know, I've walked back and forth and seen you here at the bus stop. The buses don't run today. It's a holiday. <laughs> I said, really? Cerritos College was seven miles from my house, and I just took off running. And uh, I ran seven miles to get to practice. And I didn't even think twice about it. It's just what I did. I wanted to be there until later uh, when I was playing in the NBA, I was up at Cerritos and I went to one of their workouts in the summer. And one of the guys said, we know who you are. Coach talks about how you ran seven miles to practice <laughs> one day. And that was the first time I had thought about it literally until then. So just a little bit of an indication of the obsession that I had. So this was inherent in your DNA. When did you first see this infatuation with the game come about? How young were you? Who introduced you to the sport? No one really introduced me. I was 10 years old and ball rolled my way during uh, recess at, in school, uh, which is when I would play also. And I shot the ball, made it, became hooked ever since then, and uh, just – probably have more of a compulsive uh, personality I have. And whenever I do, I go at it all wholeheartedly, 100%. And uh, it was just so much fun, you know, to compete and to go out and try to get better and watch players that 
uh, you watched on television that were just so good and adept at what they were doing and just trying to pick those things up. I'd watch a game and couldn't wait to the game for the game to end to go down to the playground to practice. Uh, uh, and there were also, growing up in Compton, many, many big time athletes. And, and uh, there was that competition to go out there and play. And it was just something I couldn't get enough of. You have also found so much success as far as the competition in <clears throat> garnering good recruits. You have been such a tactful recruiter over your career. You, I look at you as a, a manufacturing plant for producing NBA talent. How did you get like that? I've been fortunate, again, very blessed to be at institutions that uh, help whatever they're recruiting. I would say that if you don't do well at some of these places where I've been, then you probably just can't recruit. You're just probably not any good at it because they help. Being an assistant at UCLA, you know, coaching at Pepperdine, coaching at the University of Washington, there was so much talent over the years when we were in Seattle that, uh, you know, you convinced the guys to stay home. And that was, that was very helpful. Uh, you know, if I was in another place uh, where it's more of a rural area and it's a little tougher, maybe things wouldn't have gone as well. But we've been in some special places. I've had really good assistants that have done a tremendous job in helping me recruit. But uh, I, I also think over the years, just being honest, uh, treating people the way you would want to be treated, treating them with respect, uh, gaining their trust, uh, I, I think those things have been very important as well. Lorenzo Romar joins us, Pepperdine head coach. I'm Brian Fenley. You mentioned you've had some great assistants under your watch over your coaching career. You yourself were a great assistant during that 1995 national championship run with UCLA. What's a particular feat or a game or a moment from that storybook season that even to this day still leaves you speechless? Well, if you, if you ever get a chance to experience winning a national championship, try and do that. It's <laughs> a lot of fun. Uh, it's a culmination of the entire season. Once you win the championship, you know, nothing tops that. But there were some big wins. I think our second or third game of the year, we beat Kentucky in the Wooden Classic, and that catapulted us into first place, uh, number one in the country in the rankings. And, we stayed there the rest of the year. That, that was huge, that win. Ty Sedney hits a bucket with 4.8 seconds to go. We get the ball, and he scores at the buzzer in the second round of the NCAA tournament. And uh, that allows us to go on. If he doesn't make that shot, then none of that would have happened. Uh, watching Ed O'Bannon, Ty Sedney, and George Zedek are three seniors that year lead like I've never seen anyone lead before they set great examples for our team and then you know watching the masterful job that Jim Herrick did with that team a lot of people don't understand maybe the two biggest wins that year you know Kentucky was a big win and there were some other ones that were huge but when Ty Sedney hit the shot with 4.8 seconds to go Missouri scored and it looked like we may drop this game it was tough, 4.8 seconds, you're down one, and Ty comes off the floor, and Coach Herrick met him out on the floor and said, you're going to shoot the ball. NCAA timeouts are two minutes long. Ty's had two minutes to think about that, what Jim Herrick said. I want you to shoot the basketball. And he created a situation where Ty's could catch the ball going full speed, and he told him, do not pass it. He said, the reason... The reason I don't want you to pass it is because we have precious time. He says, they're not going to foul you. They don't want to risk fouling. And those things that he told him during that time out, I think, is what allowed him to uh, make the shot. If he wouldn't have mentioned one of those things, uh, maybe Tyus would have been a little bit hesitant. But that allowed him to make the shot. And then the, the genius in Jim Herrick is we played Arkansas in between Saturday and Monday. We played Oklahoma State in the semifinals uh, where they had a guy named Brian Reeves. They nicknamed him Big Country, which was really good. And uh, we played them, and we won that game. In between Saturday and Monday, we had to prepare for Arkansas, who were the reigning champs, mm -hmm. uh, the NCAA reigning champs. And, you know, they played their 40 minutes pressuring the basketball and creating turnovers and – they put the heat on you, and 
uh, we didn't practice in between Saturday and Monday. We wow. never went to the gym. We, we did some, uh, some film work. We got on the board. Uh, coach talked about their personnel. We went over the scout. But in terms of handling this pressure, this is what we're going to do uh, in terms of getting on the floor. Coach had our team so well drilled that uh, we just knew how to get, make passes and how to get the spots and how to space the floor. And uh, we went out there without Ty Sedney, who only played yeah. for four minutes, and we ended up winning that ball game. Uh, you know, people say, well, what a great job Jim Herrick did to win a national championship. But when you, when you look inside of that year and you see some of those things that he did within our team, you can't help but be really, really impressed and appreciate even more the job that he did. So when you talk about certain things that happened throughout the year, certain games and all, those are some of my fondest memories that made that season work. So, you know, dialing it back to that Tyus Sedney play, the infamous shot against Missouri, and I just watch, Lorenzo, the cool, casual demeanor of Jim Herrick after the Tigers take the lead under five seconds to go as players, you being an assistant, you look to your head coach to see what kind of vibe he is giving off. Is he nervous? And that rubs off on the guys, but just how cool he was just set the tone for that play, I believe. And Ed O'Bannon wanted the basketball, right? Even though Ty said he was told to take the shot. And then J.R. Henderson desperately was underneath the basket and said, do not pass me the ball, please. Whatever you do, don't do that. <laughs> so what was your vantage point seeing all this unfold right before you guys get back onto the court down under five seconds to go to the play itself, to the aftermath, take me inside the mind of Lorenzo Romar during that famed sequence of basketball. Well, we wanted uh, coach had talked about getting Tyus the ball again he was going to uh, start away from the basketball uh, a little above the top of the key and then catch the ball on the run. And that's what we wanted. So as we break the huddle and we go out on the floor, you know, you asked what was going on in my mind. The one thing I wanted to see is what Missouri's coverage was going to be like. Uh, the thing that could have prevented that play from happening would have been if the inbounder, the defender guarding the inbounder, would have double team ties if he had been in front of him and then a uh, guy guarding ties would have been behind you know hindsight's 2020 but that would have prevented ties from catching the ball on the run that way he probably would have had to come back to get the ball <clears throat> excuse me and yeah when we when we walked out on the floor i looked okay they're playing behind him yes they're playing behind him that was the first uh, positive there that, okay, we've got a chance for this to work if they're playing behind them. When Tyus caught the ball and Coach Herrick, <clears throat> something else he did was he had Cameron Dollar take the ball out, who was a great passer and very calm. And Cameron takes it out, hits Tyus on the run. And what you could see was another defender was at half court. And what Missouri was trying to do was get Tyus to go one way and then they would send him to this other defender and then uh -huh. make him give up the basketball with the double team. And then time would elapse and it, it, would, it would be over. Well, Tyus, as good a basketball player as he was, had this speed, this gear where he can go from zero to 60 in about three seconds. And as he's going left, you can see the other defender coming over to get him. And then Tyus put the ball behind his back. And didn't just put it behind his back. He whipped it behind his back and kicked it ahead so that he didn't break stride. And now what you had is his defender and the guy that's going to double him, they're both on the left side now of Tyus, ah. which allowed him to take the ball. Are we going to get enough time to get there? It's, it's like one of those movies where the clock is going, one second ticks off. It seems like a minute. It just yes. seems like wow, look what's going to happen. And he gets closer and closer. And then they had a player named Derek Grimm. He was six foot eight. And I always joke that uh, if he wouldn't have cut his fingernails, he might have. <laughs> it was that close. That wow. close. And Tyus lets it roll off and um, ball goes in the basket and the celebration was there. And after that, we went on to do what we needed to do to win. There were some weird celebrations 
post game, you had, I think some guys, I think, was it a guy or two had like a towel around their head and they were superstitious about it all? If you go back and you look at the film just for fun, if you want yeah. to do that, if you got nothing else to do, some kind of way you go back and you just watch Chris Johnson yeah. was the ringleader of all of that. You know? <laughs> First he had his, his towel around his neck, then he had it on top of his head, then it was tied around, uh, you know, like uh, Alibaba or somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just doing, he just, every time you looked at him, he was doing something different. He was dancing, he was... He was totally into it. You could yeah. see it. That was going on. Uh, I remember Steve Lavin running out on the floor and yes. trying to put on the brakes, and he was, like, skidding. And, uh, <laughs> guys were crying like, I can't believe it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there's a guy that played for Missouri that I ended up coaching at St. Louis. Oh, wow. And I felt like I knew him because they show him on all fours just devastated mm -hmm. and when I saw him in person years later I said I know you that face like <laughs> like like I know you personally just from the see, watching the video so many times so there were all kind of things going on like you said little little celebrations on the side in the midst of the celebration one of our managers got hit in the nose and got his nose uh got a nose bleed oh. <laughs> everything was going on <laughs> some friendly fire and yeah. You, when you begin to quantify the year that Ed O'Bannon had, where does it stack up as an individual single season performance in college basketball history? It's, uh, it's got to be right up there at the top when you talk about how it ended. Yeah. You know, I, I think of Danny Manning with, in 1988 with Kansas. Sure. Uh, the Danny and the Miracles, they called him. Uh, that was a that was a heck of a year, heck of a performance uh, by him. You, you go back some of the great UCLA teams, the years that Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, those guys had. Those are phenomenal years. Uh, but Ed Ed had a special one. When you talk about uh, thirty points and seventeen rebounds in the championship game, and just the way that. Uh, our, our guys fired him, uh, followed him. Steve Lavin used to joke and call him Daddy Lion. He would say that, you know, we had some of these younger players that were rambunctious and joking all the time, and Ed would just kind of sit over there and not say a whole lot. But whenever he spoke, it was like the little lion cubs running around. But when the lion roared, they all stopped to see what the lion was roaring at. Wow. You know? And that's the kind of impact and uh, aura that Ed had about himself that year. Ed went on to the NBA. You played in the NBA. When did you know your own playing career professionally was done? I would say when I was with the Detroit Pistons and uh, I had been cut twice cool. in the NBA. It was, my, it was my fifth year in the league. And I was, uh, when I was with Golden State, when I played with them, there were other guards that could do things that I couldn't do, but I could always do something that they couldn't do, sure. which allowed me a place on the team. When I was with the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, I remember just seeing my niche and seeing where I could help the team. But when I was in Detroit, I was backing up a guy named Isaiah Thomas. And you might've heard of him, <laughs> yeah. Whatever I could do well, he could do it three times as well. Wow. And it was just, there was just no place where I saw I could have an impact on the court. Obviously, I was going to be a team guy and try to push everyone in practice, but I didn't see it. And I remember getting cut from that team. Now it was the third time in a year. And at that point, you just felt like, okay, it's, uh, you tricked them for five years. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> you made it for five years. This, this might be it. Well, I, I heard your story listening and watching your interview on fair game where you describe the way in which you found out you were drafted and, and also what it was like after your playing career and the wages in the league at that point, not as cushy and high end as they are today. And so here you are trying to find a way to, to make ends meet, to get your life going on its next path after playing 
What was humbling to you about how you had to generate a source of income before you got totally invested in coaching? Well, you know, I made my rookie year, I made 42,000. The most money I ever made in the NBA for a year was 52,000. It was never guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So you talk about, I was out of uh, uh, work a couple of times when I had been cut. And now we had a child, my wife and I, a child on the way. And uh, it was coming up, it was a half a year. It was coming up to where bills were gonna have to continue to be paid and there was no income coming in. So it was gonna have to get something. But uh, as a youngster, we talk about all that time I spent in, uh, in the playgrounds playing basketball, that obsession. Well, I didn't have that obsession with school. So <laughs> I, I go to high school and just kind of got through. When I get to junior college, my freshman year, um, I was academically ineligible. So it, I was devastated because I had this obsession with yeah. basketball. And uh, – now that I had allowed that to be taken away from me and deservedly so. Mm -hmm. So I got back, got my grades up high enough to where, and, and had the understanding, look, if you want to be eligible, you have to do well enough to be eligible. And that's what I did. I did well enough to be eligible, but nothing uh, beyond that. And, you know, my last year at, at the university of Washington, I didn't take it serious, uh, seriously at all. So I, I eventually was out of work and said, well, I'll get a job. And I literally would pick up the newspaper back then and yeah. I looked in the one as the classified section and wow. I didn't see anything that I was qualified to do. And whatever jobs looked like it could pay enough for, for us to be able to make it mm -hmm. required a degree, a master's, a certification of some type. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't have any. So wow. the one thing I did was uh, take them up on a position uh, selling dictionaries door to door door to door uh, I was in the NBA the year before so you just imagine you open the door to someone you're watching on television wow. and they're at your door selling dictionaries it was very very humbling um, and I, I worked my way to a big office building and thought there are a lot of people in this office building a lot of offices I'll park my car here and get rid of all these dictionaries here and mm -hmm. I get in there and I mentioned to this lady at the front desk what I was there for. And she said, uh, let me go ask my boss. Let me see what he thinks. Mm -hmm. So she goes and gets his boss. Her boss comes back and he sees me and he says, Lorenzo Romar. Wow. He says, man, great to see you. Look, uh, you're going to get back on a team. I know you got cut. You're too good of a player. Someone's going to pick you up, man. I love watching you play. And he looked at the receptionist. He says, now, where's the guy that's selling the dictionaries? Oh, my goodness. And all three of us were humiliated and awkward. It was awkward for her, awkward for uh, the guys, because he was a season ticket holder. And he watched all of our games. And uh, she pointed to me and said, there he is right there. And it was... It was very difficult at that point. It had caught up with me, not taking education seriously. Uh, it had finally caught up with me and I learned a valuable lesson. I went back and got my degree eventually. And that's why I always uh, am a stickler on our guys about making sure you get your degree, not only just get a piece of paper, but try to learn something while you're at it, yeah. you know, to prepare yourselves so that when you're done with this game, you can go out and do something else. What does that look like for you, making sure your own players don't make the same mistakes as you? How do you reinforce that to them specifically? And again, not following the path that you learned from, obviously. Well, for one, I've never let anyone else be the point person on our staff in terms of checking their grades oh. and uh, holding them accountable. Uh, I never wanted it to be a situation where uh, they aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And one of my assistants tells me, and now I've got to get involved at that point. Nope. I wanted to be involved from day one. I wanted them to know how important it was for me. And, uh, you know, I've, I'm the one that issues the discipline when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And I'm on top of it. I tell them in the recruiting process, if you don't, I say, I'm a nosy coach. 
And uh, I, I tell them in front of their parents, look, yeah. if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it's not going to be between you and I. I'm going to let them know. Wow. Uh, this is a big deal and you don't, uh, we take this seriously. And every now and then I will tell them my story if it's, mm -hmm. uh, if it's applicable. And um, so they understand it. And I think when I was uh, at Washington, uh, we, we coached 45 players that were there for four years. Wow. And out of the 45, 44 of them got their degree. Wow. And, and one of them had made a whole lot of money and he just wasn't quite as motivated to finish, but hopefully one day he'll finish. And uh, that's my goal to have a hundred percent graduation rate for anybody that, that plays for us, wherever I'm coaching. A lot of it has to do with the experience that I had. And now, ultimately now understanding the importance and value of the education myself. Coaches value wins, but I think they also, and people from the outside don't see this, they value how much the percentage of their players can get that education. Yeah, it's fulfilling to get those wins and, and win those conference championships. But for you, when you have a guy that runs out of eligibility, did you do your part to help him get that degree to set his life up for himself after playing? And so we, we always talk about a coach's resume, but you brought up the point and how many of your own players have not made the same mistake as you based upon the experiences that you had. You, when you were at Washington and you just brought that up, you were a conference coach of the year, three different seasons, which is now the PAC 12. And over those, what was it, 15 years you were in Seattle, which team did you feel had the best chance of making the Final Four? Without question, 2006. Uh, 2006 of the team that we coached, a potential 2000 uh, a Final Four team would have been the team that we would have had if uh, DeJounte Murray, who is now with the San Antonio Spurs, and Marquise Chris, who were the Golden State Warriors, they were freshmen and they left after their freshman year. Uh, and I was in total support. They have gone on to do fine. They're still in the league. But if they would have stayed, they would have joined Markel Fultz, who was the number one pick in the draft the next year. And the young players that we had had the two previous years would have been older. So when you put that mix together, I think it would have been a special team. But the team with Brandon Roy, and uh, that led by Brandon Roy was the team that, you know, not just on paper had a chance. And matter of fact, let me say that differently. On paper had no chance, but we play UConn in the sweet 16 and we're up seven with a minute and a half to go. And if we win that game, we play George Mason and no slight to George Mason at all because they eventually made it. But mm -hmm. people were touting them as a Cinderella. We felt we were the Cinderella team, so sure. there was not going to be a letdown. And we would have been one game away. We didn't win that game and go to the Final Four. Brandon Roy and four, three other seniors on your team, you like your chances, but we didn't get it done. We lost the UConn in overtime, but that would have been the team that would have taken us to the Final Four. What kind of career would we have seen out of Brandon Roy if he didn't have the injuries? You know how you have the top 50 all-time greats? They've had those. Mm -hmm. But whenever they did it again, Brandon would have been in that. Wow. He would have been a perennial all-star. Uh, I, I was privy to a conversation with several NBA guys in the conversation. Uh, Jamal Crawford was one of them. Oh, cool. Brandon was another one. This is when Brandon was in the league. And we got on the discussion, you know, those guys, that group of guys will talk about basketball all the time. And Coach, who do you think was the best player ever played? You know, we get in those arguments. Well, what about so-and-so? How good was this guy? So this particular topic was who were the top 10 players in the NBA at that time. And to hear Brandon Roy say, without being arrogant at all, mm -hmm. is why I think I'm in the top five. And he would make his case. And Jamal said, you know what? I think I would put you here. And I mean, but there's Brandon. We're having this conversation and that's him. Yeah. And it was the general thought. I mean, this guy is one of the up and coming uh, best guards in the NBA and maybe one of the all time greats that would ever play the game. I think Kobe Bryant said, 
I think Kobe Bryant was quoted as saying, the only other guy in the league that is as complete as me would be Brandon Roy. Wow, what a compliment. World met a piece, then Ron Artest said that uh, Brandon was his most difficult guy to, to guard uh, in the NBA. So he was, he was a heck of a player. He was multidimensional on the court. What astounded you most about coaching Nate Robinson? His competitiveness. The exciting thing, you know, he was the guy, I mean, it's unbelievable how exciting a basketball player he was. Yeah. He played football, Brian, and he came out uh, on, and practiced the first time as a freshman. And he comes out there, and us coaches watch for five minutes, and we're going like, <laughs> I mean, right away, you could just see how good a basketball player he was. Uh, so he plays uh, football. They, they go to their bowl game. Finally, they're done, and now he's with us for the basketball season. He comes out. It was our second game or third game of the year, and we go to Santa Clara. Okay. He's a freshman. He doesn't know any of the plays. <laughs> he doesn't know our defensive schemes because he's been playing football. Sure. As a matter of fact, his first game back, he's playing defense on a guy down the floor, and he's covering him like a DB, you know, he's <laughs> right there, you know, with him. Oh, and my gosh. Says, Come on, Nate, help side. Get over. Help side defense now, you know. Yeah. And that's how raw in terms of, knowing what our concepts were, he was. But he had ability, raw ability. Wow. He eventually learned our system, obviously, but when you're talking about playing football, remembering all their coverages, and now you have only practiced a few times and you're coming out with basketball as a freshman. But we go to Santa Clara, and the game, uh, it was one of those really grinding, slow down, move the chains type of game in the snow, Green Bay versus the Bears on Thanksgiving mm -hmm. back in the day. You know, one of those kind of games. Sure. We're down, uh, we're, or we're down two or up two, and we said, we got to get something going. Let, let's, let's try Nate. Let's just try Nate to see if he can get anything going. So he comes in the game, he gets a steal, uh, we put him in with five minutes to go. He gets a steal, gets a layup. There's two points. But then we call a play, and he's running in front of the guy, and, and he's in the way of the play and defensive coverage. He just would go double-team someone. They might get a layup. He was trying. He just didn't know our schemes. Hmm. We go in at halftime. We come out in the second half, and it's more of the same. But we're thinking, you know what, if we don't get something going, they're up two right now. They're going to control this game the rest of the way. We're going to be in trouble. Let's give Nate another try. When the dust settled, we had won that game by 16 points. Wow. Nate had scored 15 points in the second half, 17 for the game. When the game ended, we're on the road at Santa Clara. Their fans stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Wow. And that was the beginning of Nate Robinson's stardom at, at the University of Washington. The star was born, the coming out party. Yeah. I loved your tweet. I think it was a couple months ago where you were praising Markel Fultz, and I'm going to read a bit of it. You talked about how, quote, what a great example of perseverance by Markel. So many doubted him, but he didn't listen to the doubt. He's now back scratching the surface of what he can be, scratching the surface for a – a road win and a triple double against the Lakers. Then you went on to say congratulations. Markel got a lot of criticism, as you pointed out. People thought he was going to be a bust, but he stayed with it. When you see how much he stayed with it and saw how he was able to carve himself out that career as a coach who was part of his basketball resume, what does that have to mean to you? It, uh, so much pride you're so proud of him to be able to handle that situation so much unfair criticism so many people who didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes this man was really if he was really hurt he was injured he couldn't uh, he couldn't raise his arms up the way he wanted to to shoot the basketball it was a testament to him that he even still tried to play the game knowing that he could really 
uh, shoot the basketball the way he wanted to in terms of his mechanics. And uh, he didn't do a whole lot of complaining. You know, he had a lot of moments to himself where it was rough on him. He went through a lot, but he stuck with it and came back. And now that he's back, you don't hear him having a whole lot of bitter conversations. Mm. He said it maybe a couple of times about people doubting him and that, but it's in conversation and it's the truth, but he doesn't come across as bitter. He comes across as grateful that he's back in there doing what he loves to do. And uh, I just know I watched him for a long time with our team and recruited him. And that guy's a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. You bring up Brandon Roy, mm -hmm. Brandon Roy and I were talking when Markel was at Washington and he says, coach, you know me, I don't like to give it up, but uh, <laughs> he's better than I was. That said. is saying that something. That was a heck of a compliment. And uh, so the guy could play. He wasn't a bust. He was a bust if you talk about he wasn't out there. But does that really how you define a bust? You know, I always think a bust is someone that people made a mistake on that they weren't very good. They, they thought they were much better than he was. I don't know if people understand. I know I've spoken to Orlando, there are people there, they understand, they understand, and because uh, he's healthy now, but just the general public that didn't know anything about Markel, uh, had no idea what he went through, and uh, that's why I tweeted what I tweeted, because I was so proud of how he handled the situation, and uh, he's bounced back. Yeah, people, the, the casual fan, just way too impatient. They don't understand, like you said, that there are injuries and other issues that they're not privy to knowing about that contribute to why a player isn't reaching whatever their expectations are, but give it time. Markel's young. He's going to figure it out and he's got you in his inner circle. So of course he's going to do well and figure it all out. Now you're with the waves and you've been here before. This is a program that has not been to the NCAA tournament or the NIT in a long time you know what it's like to go to the NCAA tournament. You've been many a time. How close do you feel this program is to turning the corner and sniffing the postseason? Because it's so hard when you've got the Gonzaga and the St. Mary's and the BYU hanging around, those heavyweights. I'm not much of a prophet, but I can tell you this. We're much closer than we were a couple years ago. Sure. And I think uh, we're the trajectory – that we're on is, uh, is a good one. And I'll say that. And I think uh, the last couple of years, we've had one of the youngest rosters in the country. Now those young guys are older. You don't win in college basketball when you're young. You don't, uh, a lot of times, even when you have star talent, a lot of times you don't reach your potential and people don't understand why. But you look over the years, the young teams, uh, it just just a little harder and there's no way you can get around it other than them grow and get older and i think our team is older now and i think this year will be a year that we can begin to really make strides and in uh getting to that point i want to ask you about the key players on your team but you also are older now taking over this pepperdine team for the second time in your career what has evolved about the way you oversee and manage a program, say, in 1996, when you got your first head coaching gig with the Waves to the guy that takes over the program a couple of years ago and all that experience that you've accumulated leading up to then? I think knowing what is important and what are the essentials and knowing who I am as a coach, my personality and how I best function. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest, those are the biggest things for me. And then, you know, okay, what is exactly does that mean? Knowing what the essentials are. Defensively, what are you going to have to be really good at with no excuses, no exceptions, and you're not, no, uh, not, no tolerance at all for uh, mediocrity in this area? Because if there is mediocrity, you're just not going to be as good knowing what those things are offensively and defensively uh i have a pretty good feel for those things now and didn't have as good of a feel for 96 when i was 
my first year as a head coach, I basically just tried to do everything Coach Herrick did uh, that was taught, which is not bad knowing how good a coach he is and was. Uh, but you also have to coach your personality too. And I'm, I'm not Jim Herrick. He's Jim Herrick. And we still do the things, a lot of the things that we did when I was with him offensively and even drills, all of that stuff. But there's just certain, certain uh, things that we do that may be a little different because it's more my personality. Uh, back in the day, there was a guy named Bobby Knight that was one of the greatest coaches of all time. And you'd see all these little Bobby Knight juniors running around as coaches trying to coach like Bobby Knight. That wasn't their personality. Uh, some other coach that maybe uh, uh, up tempo and really gets guys going and moving and in your face defensively. That's not your personality. Maybe your personality is to play more slow down basketball, uh, smash mouth basketball, go inside physical. Maybe that's your personality, but knowing who you are, your personality is huge. What you are very comfortable and convicted in, in coaching. And Jim Herrick would always say, teach what you know and know what you teach. And that's really, really important. So the essentials, what's really important, and then what is my personality, what I, what I can coach best. And they kind of go hand in hand, but those would be the most less, uh, the top lessons I've learned. Yeah, and I, I feel like anyone breaking into a business, they look at their idols and they want to be just like them. Like you, you saw Jim Herrick, you were on that team coaching in 95 but then you found your own voice you found your niche and what you thrive in and what I've also noticed about you Lorenzo is loyalty seems to be so important to you you go back to schools Lorenzo you went to Pepperdine and then you came back to Pepperdine you were a college player at Washington you coached them for 15 years relationships seem to be so important to you and when I think about why you're such a good recruiter, it's got to be because you're so personable and you've developed these relationships that have helped you along the way. And when you consider the talent on the floor coming up for you this season with Pepperdine, who are some of the, the big stars that you are going to look to to make headway? Well, probably one of the more underappreciated uh, guards in America, and I don't mean in the West Coast Conference or the West Coast, I mean in America, wow. is Colby Ross. You talk about a young man that as a junior became the all-time assist leader in school's history, and if we'd had one or two more games, he'd become the all-time leading scorer in the school's history as a junior. Uh, he is a phenomenal point guard, phenomenal basketball player, and, uh, you know, I I want us to be successful for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons would be to see Kobe uh, leave on top. He's going to be a senior this year and get the recognition that he deserves. You're talking about someone who was very, uh, very, uh, was looked over in terms of recruiting, didn't have a whole lot of offers, but now has emerged as one of the top point guards in the country and uh, a guard that the NBA is taking a good hard look at. Um, so, that would be for starters. Uh, we have a guy, the younger brother of a guy that just graduated, Cameron Edwards graduated, and his younger brother is Kessler Edwards. And uh, he's six foot eight, he's long, he can shoot the three, he's athletic. He led the league in block shots last year as a sophomore. He's back. Uh, he had definitely has pro potential, and uh, both of those guys have high basketball IQs. and. Coming back this year, I think when you talk about Pepperdine, those are the two that would probably lead the way, lead the charge. But I think we have some others, uh, a host of other guys that uh, have the potential to step up and be right there with those guys. Lorenzo, my final question for you. Knowing the post you hold at Pepperdine and knowing how good of a recruiter you are, what makes your position where you are, the location of the school, the environment and the resources, how do you put that all together and use that as your unique recruiting pitch to get the best talent you can to come to the waves? 
we, we've never lost anyone because they came to our campus and didn't <laughs> like our campus. I would have to agree, You're, yeah. So the campus is immaculate, the area, the view, all of that scenery is great. But then academically, uh, you know, we don't really take a back seat to many. Pepperdine has a very, uh, a very good uh, reputation academically. Uh, that's really important. Uh, Pepperdine, although you mentioned recently, hasn't done a lot in postseason, but before that had great tradition in, in this league. Uh, those are the things we talk about. I, I also, nowadays kids, you know, we, we all wanted to play in the NBA when we were youngsters. You know, when, you're, when you play sports, you want to play at the highest level. But I think even more so, it's really, really a big deal with the advent of NBA hardship where kids can get there quickly. You know, it becomes more important to them that they go somewhere where they can get to the league as quickly as they can. And I think our track record uh, in being involved with players that have gone on to play in the NBA that weren't necessarily highly touted or thought of as NBA players when they came in, became NBA players when they left, I think that appeals to the youngsters as well. When we were at Pepperdine before, one of my assistants, Gerald Brown, played okay. for us. He ended up playing for the Phoenix Suns. We recruited another kid uh, that was with us in his first year. He left two years later to go to the NBA named Brandon Armstrong, but he was with us for a year. So there were a couple of guys when we were at Pepperdine before that went on to play in the NBA. And now we've got a few on our, on our, uh, on our campus that uh, have a chance to do that also. So I think the consistency over the years where kids can see that um, we can go to Pepperdine and still reach our dreams. I think when you put all of that together, the location, the academics, uh, the potential to play at the highest level and be successful in terms of winning, I think that appeals to guys. The pedigree you've coached, what is it, 10 first round draft picks? Other guys, Justin Holiday, Will Conroy, they went on to play in the league. They were undrafted, but you look at your resume, you look at your pedigree, why wouldn't you come and play for Coach Romar? And then you said also that some of the guys that came in maybe weren't as heralded, but when they left, they were. And that's just a, a testament to your skill development and how much you are integrating that into your philosophy and that guys come in, they get better, and they can make a career out of their basketball future after college. And Lorenzo, I am, I'm humbled. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered to have you on, and I really appreciate your time. I, you're, you're such an incredible storyteller. I mean, I, I, I want to do this again when, 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 when down the road, man, I, I wanted, I could just listen to story and story and story. You, you have a, a another career as a storyteller.